Genesis 37. Why don't we go ahead and open up our Bibles? Genesis 37. Praise the Lord. Now, Genesis 37, okay, it's one of the most remarkable life stories in the Bible, in my opinion, okay? We've been following the stories of many great men of faith throughout this time of study, right, through the book of Genesis. Now, Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, right? A great cloud of witnesses. In other words, many of those that have gone before us, those that we can learn from, those that we can be encouraged through in our walk of faith, amen? In the beginning, we covered, we covered the story of Enoch, right, that shows us the walk of faith. We covered the story of Noah that shows us the perseverance of faith. We read the story of Abraham that shows us the obedience of faith. We read the story of Isaac that shows us the power of faith. We just came out of the story of Jacob, which shows us the discipline of faith. And now we are entering into the story of Joseph. How many love the story of Joseph? I love Joseph, right? Here, we're going to see the triumph of faith. Amen? Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand. Now, Joseph is one of the greatest characters in the Bible, okay, along with Daniel. He's only one of two major characters where there's no sin that is mentioned, okay? The one, there's one, one, one quarter of, of Genesis is dedicated to Joseph. You would think that God would spend more time with creation, right? Because creation is huge, right? The universe is huge, and the universe is still growing. You know, every, every time that you see like these, these uh, scientists and all of them, they continue to build more, more uh, telescopes, you know, to try to find more what's going on out there, right? They try to, try to research more, you know? Come to find out that every time when they build a big one, it shows more in depth of the universe, and they find out how much less we know. I believe that the information that we know as far as the universe is concerned is but a speck of sand in, in comparison to God's creation, right? But here God spends 12 chapters on a single individual. I believe that the reason why he does that is because Joseph is a wonderful, he's a remarkable, he's a powerful picture of Jesus. And Jesus, how many of us know that Jesus is the main subject, the main interest that God loves? Amen? So as we dive into the story of Joseph, we're going to see that he was loved, and we're going to see that he was hated. We're going to see that he was favored, and that he was abused. We're going to see that he was tempted, and that he was trusted, that he was exalted, and that he was degraded. Yet over the 110-year life of this powerful character in the Bible, we'll see that he never, never took his eyes off of God. He never ceased to trust God in everything that he's gone through. We're going to cover some of that of what he's going through. We're going to see that Joseph goes through a whole lot of adversity, right? But even through all that adversary, adversity, it never hardens his character. He experiences prosperity, but even that doesn't ruin him. Joseph was a type of guy that was the same indoors as he was outdoors. He was the same in secret as he was in public. Amen? How many of us know that that's how we got to be? Right? That's how we got to be. We can't be. We can't be coming to church and putting up a front, and then back home we're a different person. Right? We got to be the same all the way around. So as we follow the life of Joseph, we're going to find some insights about Jesus. We're going to see some prophecies that point to Jesus. And we're also going to have some understandings concerning the nature of Jesus. So in other words, wherever we touch on Joseph, we're going to touch Jesus. Amen? So let's go ahead and get started. Verse 1. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. Now this is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers. 
the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. I did pretty good on the pronunciations, huh? Not like last week. Last week, man, there was a whole lot of butchering, huh? Amen. Tongue twisters. Okay, now Joseph, Joseph was the 11th son of Jacob. Okay, he was the firstborn of Rachel whom, Joseph, whom Jacob loved. He was the second of the youngest of all the sons, and he was Jacob's favorite. Now, one would think that Jacob would have learned his lessons, right, about favoritism. Because after all, Jacob comes from a dysfunctional family of favoritisms, right? We remember that Esau was, was uh, Isaac's favorite, and Jacob was Rebekah's favorite. And we saw that the problems that that, that that caused. So here we're seeing that the trouble continues, okay? The troubles continues in the sons of Jacob. Sons of Jacob, you know, from four different mothers, all living and working together, right? Can you imagine the rivalry that went on? Can you imagine the competition and the jealousy that went on, right? But Joseph was the favorite, okay? So it says here that Joseph was out in the field shepherding with his brothers, which is typical because usually the youngest son was out there shepherding, right? As we see in the story of David. David was out there shepherding when the prophet Samuel anointed him. So he was out there shepherding, but in this case, it's talking about him pasturing. He was pasturing and he was feeding the sheep, which is an indication that Joseph was in charge. Okay? Now, in verse 2, it says that Joseph brought back a bad report to his fathers about his brothers. Now, some may say that he was being a tattletale. Some may call Joseph a snitch, right? He was the, he was the narc of the family, right? But me personally, I don't believe that. I want to lean toward the fact that Joseph was being in harmony with his father, okay? Because he loved his father. He was accountable to his father. He wanted to please his father. Okay? And Jesus is in the same category. Jesus loves the father. Jesus is accountable to the father. Jesus pleased the father. Amen? In John 8, 29, he says, I always do the things that please my father. In Luke 2, 49, he says, don't you know that I have to be about my father's business? And in John 5, 19, the son does nothing of himself, but what he sees and hears the father do, that will he do. So we see here that Jesus was all about the father's business. And this is what we see here in Joseph. Joseph was all about the father's business. So I believe that Joseph, like Jesus, was in harmony with the father. How about you? How about me? Are we in harmony with the father? Because at any given moment and in any given situation, the Bible tells us that we are either going to seek to please God or we're going to seek to please man. We're either going to be concerned about what the Father thinks about the way that we walk, the things that we do, the plans that we have, right? Or we'll be concerned of the opinions of others about those things. But the Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. And the fear of man is a snare. So in other words, there's no middle ground, church, right? We're either living in the fear of the Lord or the fear of man. So Joseph right here realized that his brothers would not be happy because after all, he went to go tell, tell them, right? But I believe that this right here paints a beautiful illustration of living life in harmony with the Father, okay? Let's continue on. Verse 3. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. In some of your translations, it might say that he made a coat of many colors. Verse 4. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now, there's a legend that I read, okay, of a godly man who lived in a cave in order to give himself over to prayer, to worship, right, to contemplation. And Satan wanted to lure him away from that life of piety, right? He sends his demons out to him to tempt him, 
right, through lust and selfishness and greed. Demon after demon comes and reports back to Satan saying, this guy's not budging. He's not moving, right? So finally Satan says, let me, let me do it. I'll do it. What does he do? He goes in the cave and he perches on this guy's shoulder and he says, your brother has just become bishop. And so this guy, when he hears that, his whole countenance changes. Now he goes from being someone who is excited, right, to now gloomy because of envy. And that's one of the tools that the enemy will do, right? He's been doing it from, from the beginning. That's one of the tools that he'll use within the body of Christ. He'll use envy, right? How many of us have ever envied someone else's position, right? Here we're seeing the brothers envy Joseph, okay? So their heart was filled with envy, and Satan knows this, okay? In the book of Acts, Stephen refers to this text that we're talking about, okay? And he says that the brothers have moved with envy against Joseph. What were they envious of? The favorite, right? What did daddy give him? The coat of many colors, right? They were envious of the coat of many colors. Now, why would they be envious of the coat of many colors? They didn't get one, right? Okay. Now, when you guys, when you guys have heard the story of Joseph as kids, and, and he'd be styling, right? When, you, when, when you've heard the story of Joseph as a kid, picture the jacket or the coat. What did it look like in your, in, in your, in your mind's eye? Colorful? Huh? Was it striped, full of colors? Yeah? Erase that from your mind. Erase that from your mind, okay? Because what it, what it, what it means here was that when it says the coat of many colors, it's talking about it being a coat of many pieces, okay? Meaning a coat with sleeves, all right? That's the many pieces was the coat with sleeves, all right? Now, back in those times, when, when, when workers would work the field, okay, they wore vests. Now, vests, they were sleeveless, okay? They wouldn't wear sleeves because they, had, they needed to move their arms around. So sleeves would only hinder their movement. Okay, a man that, had, that wore a coat with sleeves would be considered a boss. He would be considered the boss. Okay, now the sleeves were used also to carry their writing utensils, materials inside their sleeves. Where at the end, of, at the end, of the, at the end of the, the wrist, they would tie tie off with a string. They would hold it. So in modern days, it would be like a man that was holding a laptop with a cell phone and maybe some Oakley glasses, right? How many of us have ever seen somebody like that on the job site, right? So this, this is what Joseph was looking like. This is why they were so envious of him because he got a coat that basically put him in a position of boss. He was a boss man. Not only that, but the fact that he got that coat meant that he received the birthright. So now we see why they're being so envious. So now they're questioning Pops. Say, Pops, what's going on? Why, why, why are you promoting this snot-nosed kid right here? You're putting this little youngster in charge of us, right? This is going to get good, I promise. Okay, so the coat right here is signified the, the, the birthright. Now, we covered the birthright, right? The birthright goes to who? That goes to the firstborn, the oldest. Who was the oldest? Reuben. Reuben was the oldest. But Reuben disqualifies himself. He disqualifies himself back in chapter 35 because he ends up 
sleeping with his father's concubine. Right? But here, the oldest is still receiving the birthright. Because after all, Joseph is the oldest of Rachel. The wife he loved. Right? So he receives the birthright. Okay? Now, not to mention the fact that, that it says here that um, Joseph was born to his old age. Now, some have taken this thing, this part, to mean that Joseph, I mean that Jacob loved Joseph because he came late in Jacob's life. But if that were the case, then he would love Benjamin even more. Because Benjamin was the youngest. And he was also Rachel's son. Not only that, but Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. So you would think there would be a stronger attachment to this son. But no, the favorite is Joseph. Okay? Now, stick with me on this. When it says son of his old age, okay, in the Hebrew, it means Bain Zakun. Can we say Bain Zakun? Okay? Which literally means wise son. So, in fact, Zakun can also be translated as beard or bearded one, right? Which is a sign of, of wisdom, of both age and wisdom. So Jacob's love for Joseph was a reflection of his wisdom. Okay? It was a reflection of his wisdom. So why wouldn't he give it to his other sons? Well, we saw the wisdom of his other sons, right? Back in chapter 35. We saw what they did, right? When they, when they committed mass murder. So Joseph here, he demonstrates wisdom beyond maturity and beyond his age. So his father has confidence in him, okay? So this is the issue before us. The, guy, the, the, the brothers are envious because He's the one that's wearing the sleeves. He's the one that's got the birthright, okay? So we see here another picture of Christ. We see here that Joseph is the son that Jacob loved, just like Jesus is the beloved son of the father. Amen? So we see the sin here of Joseph's brother already beginning to percolate, okay? Despite uh, their brother, right, they can't find any fault in him because he, he didn't do anything wrong. He's blameless. Just like Jesus never did anything wrong. Jesus is blameless. Amen? John 6, 38 says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So even though Jesus had authority over them, he was hated by his Jewish brothers. John 1, 11 says, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Amen? Let's continue. Verse 5. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother says, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him more because of his dream and what he had said. Now, Joseph experiences a powerful dream, right? It's powerful. It's vivid. And he feels the need, that he, the, the need to share it, okay? And, then the, and in this dream, the brothers are binding sheaves, right? And they bow down to his. Now, symbolically, the sheaves represent the person. So the clear message here was that someday they were going to bow down to Joseph. Okay? Someday, but not only just bow down, they were going to get accepted because there's a difference. Okay? One, one is bowing down because you have to bow down, but there's one. The other is bowing down because you accept the fact that you should bow down. Okay? Now, we already know that, J that jo Joseph already has the right to rule over these brothers because he's got the birthright. Right? But here in this dream, what's new in this dream is that the brothers are accepting to submit. Okay? So Joseph didn't need the acceptance in order to be the ruler of the family because he was appointed by the Father alone, right? Just like Jesus was 
not only anointed, but he was appointed by the Father. Right? Okay. Now, this dream right here was predicting that one day that they would acknowledge, they would acknowledge Joseph's authority. Okay? I mean, even, even the symbols here in the dream are important. Because one day, the day of their submission will come in conjunction with the day that they would need to come and look for some wheat, some grain, right? So they would willfully bow down to Jesus in order to, I mean, to, to Joseph in order to receive it. And this right here is actually, you know, a picture of Jesus as well, right? Jesus being the Messiah, the anointed one, the appointed one, right? Who rules over the world in Israel. One day will return in glory, amen? How many believe that? One day he will return in glory to rule the nations, to rule Israel, right? Without their approval, right? One day every tongue is going to confess and every knee is going to bow. Hallelujah. But the question is, is Israel going to accept Jesus? Romans 11 tells us yes. All Israel will be saved. Romans 11, okay? So Joseph shares this dream with his brothers, and he provokes them to great anger. Why? Because they understand the meaning of this dream. Now, you would think that Joseph will hold his tongue on this, huh? Because after all, they're jealous of him. They already hate this guy because he's got the long sleeves. He's the boss man, right? And here you got Joseph coming in with happy feet, right, Pastor T? Happy feet. He's coming in with happy feet, man, and he's dishing out this dream. Okay, some would say that Joseph didn't have any tact in the way that he shared this dream. Some would say that he was immature, right, in the way that he, he told him the dream, that he was prideful and boastful. But let me share some, something with you. When it says that he had a dream, the Hebrew term for that means to bind firmly. In other words, Joseph became firmly bound up in the dream that God has given him. How many of us know that when we receive a dream or a message from God, it is a, it is a spiritual experience? One that we would never, ever forget, right? This is what Joseph went through. Joseph went through that spiritual experience, and that's why he was so excited about telling his brothers. Do you think he wanted to share this to his brothers, even though they hated him? Naturally, probably not. But the fact that he had a spiritual experience from his dream, I'll tell you what, when we, have, when we get that way, man, there's no way we can, we can contain that, right? We bubble over, and we want to tell the whole world. Huh? And this is Joseph's experience right here. He went to them because he, 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 he wanted to let them know, hey, this, is what, this is what happened. Listen, you know. Let's continue because it gets better. Verse 9, then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers, listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the matter in mind. So his second dream communicates the same thing. Okay, only this time the parents are included. All right, they're all bowing down. The symbols have changed from the sheaves of wheat to now the sun, the moon, and the stars. And Jacob knows what they mean. Anybody know what they mean? Israel. Specifically, his family, right? Sun, moon, and stars, Jacob, Rachel, and the brothers, right? So Jacob knows the interpretation of this, and we can see the tie-in in Revelation chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 1, it says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and the crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was given birth 
where she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven and, the, and an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. The tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment it was born, he was born. She gave, him, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God on his throne. So who's the woman? Israel. Israel, the 12 stars are the tribes, right? And who does she give birth to? Jesus, right? The Messiah. So this right here is actually fulfilling the prophecy from way back in Genesis chapter 3. And we see here that the enemy has always tried to overcome, has always tried to get rid of Jesus, get rid of that prophecy, right? Even to the point of always chasing, going after the people of Israel. And Satan thought that he had everything already done at the cross. But he didn't realize that the resurrection was coming. The resurrection and the ascension, right? That right there pretty much sealed his fate. So Joseph's dream not only points to the moment when his family would come to Egypt to be saved, but it also points to the future where Israel will be saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. Give the Lord praise. Somebody help her out. So now, verse 12. His brothers had gone to graze their father's flock near Shechem. Do you remember Shechem? What is, what is Shechem? It's the wicked place, right? What happened there? Right, Dinah. Dinah was, was taken advantage of, right? She was raped. But it was also a place, you know, where her brothers, Levi and Simeon, right? They turned into, yeah, they turned into Michael Myers and Jason and just slaughtered everyone, committed mass murder, okay? So Shechem was a worldly place. Let's continue, verse 13. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have, moved, they have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. So Jacob says, your brothers are in Shechem. He's telling Joseph, your brothers are in Shechem, which is what? A worldly place, a place of wickedness, a place of depravity, right? Will you go help them? He says, yes, here I am, right? Isn't that a beautiful interaction between a father and a son? Joseph leaves his father in Hebron. Hebron means fellowship or communion. Does that remind us of somebody? Jesus. Jesus left the fellowship and communion to come to this Shechem in search for his people, right? Joseph was sent to Shechem. Jesus was sent to a sinful world, amen? Shechem represents the sin of the world in this story. The name Shechem means to shoulder as in bearing a burden, Shechem was a burden. A burden to who? A burden to Jacob, right? Everything that went on, this is a burden that Jacob had to carry. But it also represents a burden that Jesus came to bear also. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Even, even the detail of the man who finds Joseph wandering around forms a picture of Jesus. Okay? Joseph is wandering about in Shechem, right? But he finds no one. Joseph is without a home. He's without a family. Reminds us of Jesus, right? Jesus came into the world that was not his own. Jesus had nowhere to lay his head, no one to receive him, right? At the end of chapter 7 of the Gospel of John, it says that everyone that was with Jesus 
went home. They went to their families. Where did Jesus go? To the Mount of Olives. Why? Because Jesus was a wanderer. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? Hallelujah. I can see why Jesus heard the thunderous voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Because Jesus knew that him coming to this world, he was going to die. He was the first to raise his hand. He says, I'll go. Right? When Jacob said, will you go? Joseph said, I am. That's Jesus. He says, send me. I'll, I'll go. Right? Praise the Lord. So Joseph goes to Shechem. And Jesus comes to Calvary. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Verse 18. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of, the, of his dreams. Now, while Joseph was a distance away, this is where they plotted to kill him, right? They planned to kill him. We see the same thing with Jesus. The Jews, the Sanhedrin, right? They were plotting to kill him as he was a distance away from Jerusalem. Amen? So we can see the sin brewing in their heart already. Because how many of us know that before we can act out into sin, it's got to brew in the heart first, right? Because the problem is an internal problem. Amen? So we see that the sin was already beginning to percolate, beginning to brew in their heart. Right? So this is the problem. The heart, the problem. Amen. So they were jealous of their brother and they were willing to kill him for what? A coat and a few dreams. Right? How many of us know that jealousy is a dangerous thing? Amen. That if we don't check the jealousy, it's going to turn into something even more wicked. Right? We got to stop that as soon as it starts. But it's kind of hard, right? When we're the ones that are jealous, right? I mean, let's think about it. If we're the ones that are, that, are, that are being jealous, we're thinking that we're doing that because, you know, we have reason to. Or we try to find reasons to justify why we're that way, right? Come on, guys, stop lying. Stop lying. Huh? Am I the only one up here with a lack of class? Come on, man. Huh? <laughs> Come on, somebody, right? Jealousy can be difficult to recognize. Because our reasons for it seem to be right. Right? Okay. But if we don't, if we don't check it, if we, don't, if we go along with jealousy without it being unchecked, it's going to turn dangerous. Okay? It would be harder to uproot that. Okay? The best way, I believe, okay, the best way I believe that we can uproot this is check yourself in a way to where if you start keeping tabs on other people, check yourself. Okay? If you start worrying about what other, other people's achievements, other people's awards, other people's, you know, blessings, check yourself. Because now you're hating. You know what I mean? Don't hate, congratulate, right? Because the same thing is going to happen to you. Right? When, when, when the Lord blesses you, Right? They're going to congratulate you. So do the same. Amen? So let's check ourselves. 21. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers... They stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him, threw him in the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. So Reuben, 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 the oldest man, the oldest guy, the responsible one, right? The one who should have showed leadership, Reuben, still trying to fight it. 
He was, he was the guy who wavers back and forth. Wavering back and forth, not knowing how to deal with this situation. He argues for a better solution, right? Back and forth, back and forth. And this is the oldest guy, the oldest brother who should have been the one to be calling the shots. Who does that sound like? Does that sound like Pontius Pilate? A man who's in charge, a governor of Rome, who should have been in charge of whatever was going on with the situation with Jesus, but he was wavering back and forth, right? Not knowing what to do. People pleaser. Then this is a man that was in charge. Both of these guys, man, were cowards. They were. If we was in the streets, they were levas. Right? Because here they got the position of authority. They got the position to do some changes. And they don't exercise it. They're wavering back and forth. Eh, going back and forth. Reuben is telling himself, well, maybe if we throw Joseph in this pit right here, it'll satisfy my brothers. Pontius Pilate says the same thing. Maybe if we get Jesus flogged, man, it'll satisfy the crying Jews. Right? And so what happens? They strip Joseph. They strip him. They strip him of his coat. They strip him of his authority. And they throw him in this empty pit. Just like Jesus. They stripped him of his robe. Right? Before he went to the cross. After the cross, he was in an empty tomb. Amen? So we see, we see the similarities, huh? That's powerful. I love, I love the story of Joseph. So Joseph's brother throw him in the pit to kill him, okay? And this paints a, 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 a picture of Jesus. The time that Jesus was in the grave after death, okay? So let's continue. Verse 25. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh. And they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother. Oh, yeah, now, he, now he's our brother. Our own flesh and blood, his brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern. And sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Now, these right here are some cold-blooded brothers, aren't they? Cold-blooded. These guys sat down and just began eating their carne asada while their little brother was screaming for mercy. Now, it doesn't tell us here that that's what he was doing. But as we go forward into Genesis chapter 42, it tells us right there. Right? That he was screaming for mercy. He was crying with all of his might for mercy. And they ignored him. We fast forward to Amos chapter 6. It says that they didn't show no remorse, no grief whatsoever. They didn't care about his feelings. Not only that, they didn't care about their dad's feelings, what it would do to their dad. Isn't that what, what sin does? Isn't that what it does? It affects not just, not just you, not just, you know, the immediate. It affects the surrounding. Not just in the now, but also in the future. Right? They cared about themselves, right? Even to the point to where... They thought they were saving their necks, right? They didn't want to kill him. So they said, let's just, put, let's just go ahead and sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let's, let's, let's just sell him, right, to try to clear their conscience. So they made, they made a profit off of somebody else's misery. Same thing with Jesus. When they sold Jesus off for 30 pieces of silver, made a profit off of his misery. Okay. Was it the right thing to do? I mean, they didn't kill him, but was it right for them to do that? It was still not right. How many of us ever jumped to 
to solutions, right? Well, how many of us, or so, let, me, let me ask it this way. How many of us choose the, the lesser of two evils, right? Even though it's not right. The lesser of two evils. I think when we're presented with something like that, we should ask ourselves, is it right? You know what I mean? Because that's what counts. Is it right? Amen. Well, let's continue. Let's continue. Praise the Lord. So, they make a profit off of Jesus, okay? They make a profit off of Joseph. So we see here that in the same way, as I mentioned, Jesus was, all, was actually handed to a Gentile pilot, just like Joseph was handed to the Gentiles, okay? He was sold off for 30 pieces of silver. Now, they sold Jesus off to the Roman people, right, to the Gentiles, because apparently, according to the law, you know, they weren't, they weren't allowed to kill. But isn't it funny how they were ready to kill this woman that was caught in adultery? Isn't it funny how they were trying to throw Jesus off a cliff? So why the hypocrisy now? Because we see God's hand at work. Prophecy had to be fulfilled, right? Because the way Jesus had to die was through crucifixion, Right? What I love about this is the victory. Because even though, even though Joseph is in a pit crying, right, begging for mercy, and these guys are sitting down having their meal, the next time that they sit down to have a meal in the presence of Joseph, Joseph is at the head of the table. Hmm? That's victory, isn't it? That is victory. And I think the biggest victory is Joseph never retaliates. That's the biggest victory. Joseph looks at them dead in the eyes as he's eating his meal. But the heart of compassion. Right? Just like Jesus. Jesus never got back to us. He never took revenge. He continues to look at us with compassion. Right? Every day we mess up. Every day we're sitting at a table eating our sinful meal while Jesus is crying out to us that he still loves us. And he wants us. This isn't the life I've chosen for you. Don't do that. Right? I love the story of Joseph. Hmm. 29. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? So Reuben wasn't around when they made the sale. right? And it, and it doesn't specify as to what he was doing or where he was at. But he was gone. And he returns and he finds the pit empty. His brother's not there. The ironic thing that went on, that, that, that goes on here, is that he's worried about himself. He says, what's going to happen to me? What am I going to do now? What he should have been asking is, what's going to happen to Joseph? He's gone, right? But what's going to happen to me? What am I going to do now? Joseph was, I mean, Reuben was too busy trying to find a solution that wasn't going to work. Remember, he was trying to do things in secret. But God knew his motive, huh? He was only doing it to save his own skin. Him being the oldest guy, he was the one responsible. If something that happened to him, who was it going to come to? The oldest one. He was already in hot water for what he did back in chapter 35. Right? So he was doing it to save his own skin. Now, had he exercised his position and stepped out in boldness, no matter how they thought about him, no matter what they did, had he stepped out in boldness, he wouldn't be singing this shoulda, coulda, wouldas, right? It'd be a different story. But instead, now he's faced with a task of having to face his father and break him the bad news, right? But when you're out to save your own skin, you'll do whatever it takes to conceal the truth, right? Or pervert it. Verse 31. Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a coat, 
slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and, and mourned for his son many days. All of his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Now here we see Jacob being deceived by the blood of a goat. How did Jacob deceive his father? With goat skins. Right? Remember, remember the, the, the first lesson that he learned in the school of hard knocks? This is a few chapters back. Anybody remember? His first lesson that he learned in the school of hard knocks. Huh? You reap what you sow. Right? In other terms that we've used, what comes around goes around. Isn't this something how it's still happening even now? Decades later? That's the power of sin. Right? It not only affects the now, but it affects the future. Right? You reap what you sow. But here, right here, we also see a wonderful picture of Christ in the goats. Okay? In Leviticus chapter 16, the law provides for a certain ritual of the Day of Atonement. Two goats are, are involved. Two goats, okay? One goat has sins placed on, on the, the, the sins of Israel placed upon it, okay? And then it's sent outside the city, outside of the assembly. The second one is killed and the blood is poured out on the altar, okay? Jesus is a picture of both goats here. Jesus is the one crucified outside the city, okay? And the blood that is shed, right, is for the sins of the world. It's to wipe the altar clean, the altar in heaven. Amen? So in this scene also, we find both goats in Joseph and in Jesus. Okay? Joseph pictures Christ sent outside the assembly of Israel. He's on his way to Egypt now. They sold him. He's on his way to Egypt. He's going outside of the assembly, okay? While the other goat is sacrificed in an effort to cover the brother's sin. You see the similarities? And then Jacob, my son has died. He's been devoured by an evil beast, right? But Jesus was also devoured by an evil beast. The evil beast of my sin, the evil beast of your sin, that devoured Christ. But the awesome thing about this story is the victory in the end. Because we know that Jesus rose again, amen? Death cannot hold him. As we follow this story of Joseph, we're going to see Joseph being the victor. That's why we call this message the triumph of Christ. I mean the triumph of faith, right? But I kind of wonder what, what's going on with the brothers. How are the brothers feeling listening to their father wail and cry? What's going on through their mind? Are they, are they full of regret? Right? Are, they, are, they, are they remorseful? Because here, Jacob is, is in anguish. Right? You, would, you would think, you know, that they supposedly love their father. You would think that they, you know, his crying would cause them you know, to have remorse, to repent, exactly. Think about, think about Joseph. What's going on through Joseph's mind as he's now on his way to Egypt, chained up, crying, wondering why his own flesh and blood turned their backs on him, Right? So the moral of this whole story is that it's better just to avoid the sin, huh? 
just avoid it. You know, there's so much that we can, we can avoid by just avoiding the sin. Jealousy, get rid of that. Jealousy, man, is like a silent killer, man. It starts to mess with your mind, then your heart. And before you know it, man, it messes with your whole life. Amen? Avoid it in the first place. So it's better to what? Live in the fear of the Lord. Make, make, that, make that your number one thing when you wake up every morning. Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live today with the fear of the Lord. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we just bless you tonight. We're thankful, Lord, for your word. We're thankful for the many lessons, Father, that we see here in the life of Joseph, in the life of the other characters, Father, that we mentioned before, Lord. We're grateful, Father, for the great cloud of witnesses, Father, that we have to learn from and to be encouraged by, Lord. But we're mostly thankful, Father, for Jesus. We're thankful, Lord God, that this chapter right here has painted a picture, Father, of what Jesus has done and what he continues to do for us, Lord. We're so grateful, Father, for such a great plan of salvation that you've given us. So we ask, Lord God, that you would forgive us, Lord. Every day we fall short, Father. Have mercy on us, Father. Forgive us, Lord. And help us each day, Father, to surrender, submit, Father, and to live our life for you. Let every day that we live, when we wake up, Lord, that we would live in the fear of the Lord, Father. So I pray, Father, that as we leave, that you would bless everyone here, Lord. Give them traveling mercies as it's raining outside, Father. Give them traveling mercies. Protect them. Bless their week, Father. And prepare us, Father, as we come again, Lord. In Jesus' name, and let everyone say, Amen. 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 God bless you, church.